Hi guys, it's Philip J. Watt here for the Conscious Society YouTube channel and today we've got Ken O'Keefe. Ken O'Keefe is a former Marine turned social activist and if you haven't heard of, uh, heard of Ken, uh, he's got a lot of progressive and necessary information to really spread to the world. So welcome to the program, Ken. Well, thank you, brother. It's a, it's a pleasure to be on. Can't make it to Australia in person, so uh, I'll be there in spirit. <laughs> well, I was at the Freedom Summits um, when you were meant to uh, be presenting with Max Egan and uh, some of the other local and, and international activists there. So I was going to ask the question, what happened? How come you weren't allowed into Australia? Well, um, uh, the visa application is still pending. Uh, <laughs> what is it? It's almost four months later, certainly three and a half months, something like that. Um, it, it's purely a political decision. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what the excuse is of the Australian government. I'm sure it'll be something along the lines of anti-Semite or hate speech or something like that, if they have the, the, the balls to... Uh, to actually uh, try and bar me. You know, I'm only barred from one nation on this planet and that's Israel. So it would be pretty, uh, pretty, pretty poignant if Australia ends up joining that very exclusive club and making it clear that a guy like me is not welcome. But it's purely politics. Uh, you know, I'm a true speaker. Uh, I don't pull any punches. I'm not into political correctness by any stretch. And um, in this world, you know, guys who speak that way aren't really favored by the state. So. I take it as a compliment that uh, the Australian government doesn't like me. I'm, I'm quite happy to have real people who uh, resonate and connect with my, my words and uh, the governments, you know, it's par for the course, really. I don't really know any government that's very favorable to this type of talking. Well, I'm not sure if it's government per se. I think there's plenty of people in the government and the military and the police that really do resonate with what you have to say. Um, we do know that the government have been infiltrated by, for lack of a better term, the shadow order, the shadow government. So they're the sort of, I guess, players, agents that I can imagine your words are uh, pissing off. But um, the, the, there is some massive truth that, and, and light that you're shining on some of the corruption and dysfunction of our uh, current political, geopolitical, and uh, the banking, the systemic sort of uh, issues that as a collective, as a, uh, you know, uh, um, not just a nation, but a, a uniting global culture should really be focusing on. Yeah, well, um, you know, point taken, uh, it's the top levels of the police, of the, the government, of the courts, of the media, you know, there's a lot of good people in all of these institutions, uh, but at the highest level, um, you have these traitors. So yes, we should make a distinction. And it's the higher levels of the Australian government that doesn't like me. I'm sure there are some, uh, or even quite a few, perhaps, uh, within the, the actual government at the working level, the, the common man level, that have no objection to me. But an important distinction to make, and I certainly recognize that. Um, you know, at the end of the day, my personal philosophy and perspective is that uh, I look at the world and I, I look at it as one of two things, acceptable or unacceptable. And in its current state, it is completely unacceptable. And before I was a father, I felt it was unacceptable. But certainly as a father, uh, I cannot imagine how any of us can seriously pretend to uh, even think that the world as it is, as we hand it over to our children, is acceptable. So I don't know how we accept the unacceptable. I am very concerned about the future of my children, and I'm sure every other uh, genuine parent who loves their kids must be concerned. Surely you're concerned about the future of your children. And if you are, what are you doing about it? Now, I'm not here to point the finger. I, I include myself in the madness of this world. It, it is a reality that we have allowed, and it's only we that can sort this issue. I certainly can't do it. Uh, you can't do it. No individual can do it. But I believe that we, as conscious human beings, we can, we can change this. We must change it. And even if we can change it, we certainly got to try. Because to sit and let this happen as if we don't have any involvement, to sit by as idle uh, you know, witnesses without actually doing what needs to be done is a huge 
uh, dishonor to ourselves and, and hugely problematic to our children. So I do what I do because I know that we can affect a better world and, and we must if we're to have any level of self-respect. Yeah, so I mentioned this to you uh, prior to this interview sort of starting is, is that, you know, being a part of the spiritual or awakening community, you, you sort of notice a lot of uh, people who are dormant agents of change and they're very passive. They like to just observe and just have that, I guess, uh, that faith or that belief that things will just work themselves out. But it takes people to affect change. As you said, it's we. We do need to stand up. We do need to do something about this, and it's not just going to fix itself. We, if we get cold, we rug up. If we want, if we get hungry, we bloody eat, don't we? So if we're exposed to a, an unnatural and unhealthy, a dysfunctional system, we do something about that. Well, I think yes. It's um, this hits at the heart of at the heart of a very, very uh, insidious and destructive philosophical outlook. Um, it's, it's oftentimes summarized in the perspective that everything is exactly as it is meant to be. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, the change will occur when uh, it's simply a matter of consciousness that we simply think, uh, a different way or, and even if we're not there in, in another very harsh form, um, you find this in Hinduism, uh, you find it in very strict, uh, aspects of karma that people who are experiencing uh, terrible hardships, so a starving African, you know, that's their karma. You know, that's, that's their experience based on previous experiences, and that's exactly where they're meant to be. Um, this is a very dangerous philosophical outlook, if you ask me, because what it does is it, it, it requires no active participation in the world. It, it simply means that you only need to work on yourself, and if you just work on yourself, then everything else will sort itself out. There is some truth to that, by the way. I, I, I absolutely agree wholeheartedly that we must go, first we must go inside. We must be honest with ourselves and deal with the demons that we all have because we're all traumatized. Generationally, we've been traumatized. It is deep and it is significant and it is imperative that we go within ourselves, be honest with ourselves, and only when we get to that point of real honesty and love for ourselves can we genuinely give to the external, and this is a very necessary process. So that I will agree with, the internal aspect is critical. However, it is not the be all end all. We must act. If, if somebody is coming, you gave a couple of examples, if somebody is coming to kill you or to enslave your children, then you must act. And that might include even in the worst case scenario, violence. So, you know, while I do not endorse violence in most circumstances, in cases of self-defense, it is the most appropriate thing to do. And this is literally, for many people, a case of self-defense. If you live in Iraq or you live in Syria uh, or you live in so many other countries that we've invaded and occupied and basically uh, committed horrendous crimes against, then fighting and killing is actually your best option. So what I'd like to do is see us eliminate our participation in the killing. We do, after all, finance the killing through our taxes. We do, after all, provide a, a certain level of consent to this madness by allowing these treasonous governments to continue to operate without exercising all of the options that we have to be able to extricate these traitors and put people in place who genuinely represent our values. Until such time as we have a government or governments that reflect our values, which generally, from the same perspective, translate to peaceful relations with everyone and ability to uh, be able to mutually work together for the benefit of the larger society. This is the very basic kind of way of seeing the world. It's a sane way of seeing the world, but it does require action. I mean... I, I, I could not disagree more with people who believe that it'll all just sort itself out and that all we need to do is meditate our way into it. I see great power, I really do, in meditation and many other forms of, of active and passive uh, resistance, but we will have to act, make no mistake about it. There is no savior coming to save the day. We are our own savior and to be our savior, we must not only have a conscience, but we must act on the conscience. You're absolutely right. Now, I want, to, I want to go back to a little bit when you talked about the 
I guess, the imperial, uh, imperialism um, of the United States and that uh, as a superpower, its dominance uh, is, uh, I guess, dwindling. There is a shift, a power shift from west to east, uh, the end of the petrodollar, the end of the, the reserve currency, the dollar currency. Um, there's a lot of problems that the US are facing and obviously uh, they're trying to extend their power within the Middle East. Uh, there is, I see it as a power grab, a resource grab, um, in, in infiltrating particular governments, uh, sovereign governments. And, and in fact, the only uh, nation that is legally uh, occupying Syria, for example, is Russia. And any other, any other government, foreign government there has not uh, followed the, the, the uh, I guess, the law, the, the legislation of the UN. So, um, but then there's that other layer, it goes back to just that one other step where there is the, uh, I guess, the, that shadow order, that elitist, um, uh, uh, I guess, power structure that are attempting what many, many social researchers have uncovered over the last century uh, to achieve a one world government, a new world, world order, a uh, basically a, um, a, an impenetrable uh, fortress. So can you elaborate on all that? Yes, well, of course, this has been the agenda of the powers that be to concentrate power further and further. Uh, the European Union is a good recent example of, of that agenda. Clearly, what the powers that be want is a centralized government in Brussels that basically strips the sovereign powers and rights of uh, nations and of the people, effectively. And the whole goal is to continue this process until we have one world government, as you know, all of us know who've been paying attention. Um, and everything that they can do to concentrate power further, they do. And they use all sorts of pretexts to do that. Uh, generally, the false flag, you know, an event carried out by our intelligence services or assets or agents of our intelligence services carry out the latest, uh, you know, mass murder, whether it's in Paris, uh, you know, with gunmen who, you know, have been eyewitnesses have said were white, you know, you know, I mean, white Muslim guys apparently who are running around uh, and yet have these very dark skinned identities presented to us. Um, you know, we always have this false flag agenda used to manipulate us into giving up more of our rights in the name of so-called security. It's a very transparent tactic. Um, at this point, I find it quite tiresome to really explain it. If you don't know these things at this point, then it's important that you take a look, go deeper. If you have friends who are so-called conspiracy theorists, um, talk to them a little bit because they might have some information for you that could be quite helpful. But the techniques are, are very transparent once you wake up to them, really. Um, and that's part of my optimism. You know, it does not take a genius to figure out what they're trying to do. In America, it's all about now we're at a stage where they want to get the guns out of the hands of the citizens. So they have many pretexts to go ahead and get people to submit to gun control laws, so-called gun control laws. But when we look deeper, and you know, I have no love for guns, but when you look deeper, you find that uh, what, would the, what would gun control laws translate to in America? Well, that would mean more power for the government and less power for the people. And interestingly, it would also include more power for the criminals because the criminals are not going to give up their guns. You can rest assured of that. It's just the law-abiding people that will give up their guns while the criminals keep theirs as well as the government, which is every bit as criminal as the so-called criminals. In fact, they're the biggest criminals of all. So, you know, there are more, more than one example, there's more than one example of where, you know, you need to think a little bit to understand what's going on. In this case, again, with gun control, it's about concentrating power. It's more power for the government, less power for the people. No matter what you think about guns, that's what the end result of such policies are. And there's many different ways to do this. In Europe, they're using the refugees, you know, from the wars that we kicked off that we're completely responsible for, through our proxies who funded this madness from the beginning, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, Turkey, Jordan as well, Kuwait, other Gulf states. I mean, we're the ones that funded this madness in Syria. And these refugees uh, who are running away, well, that's all very well and good for the system as well because it's going to use the refugees as an excuse to concentrate power further. So we see this over and over. It's very easy to identify. I'm not down with that. We need people uh, to exercise their rights. 
uh, and nations need to have genuine sovereignty, no international oversight. We know the UN is, is corrupt, as corrupt can be. It's bought and paid for. NATO, another international uh, agency, completely corrupted. Uh, we should not be consenting to these institutions at all. We should be exercising our rights to the full, and we should have maximum control within our own communities. And if we want to have a federal government or a larger centralized government, if we truly want that, then it should be very limited in its power. Uh, we should not be giving any significant power. We see in Australia, you know darn well, I mean, now vaccinations are mandatory. I mean, wow. That's, I think that's great because it will force more people to engage. Uh, I sure as hell wouldn't poison my child for anything. Uh, if I had to go to jail or be killed, for Christ's sake, I would do that before I would inject or allow someone to inject poison into my kids. Why is the government taking away the power for you to decide for your child uh, and literally exercising that right over our children and insisting by law that you inject our children with poison. I mean, it's concentration of power at every turn. So we, we, we should not be consenting to this. In fact, we should be doing the opposite and taking back, back the power that we had. Absolutely. Globalization has ripped apart the local communities. Um, I'm a big fan of Helena Norberg Hodge's work um, and Jeff Lawton's work, permaculture. Um, and the localization um, of all the relocalization of economies. Um, going back to the vaccines, the pharmaceutical companies, they're, they're, they're being exposed as the new tobacco industry. They're suppressing research, they're, they're funding um, you know, bogus studies, they're providing uh, unnecessary drugs and, and, and washing them over society. Now, from my point of view, I mean, from an immunization point of view, maybe it has been really effective in certain ways in certain times, um, you know, uh, in, in our past. But we need a dead set objective analysis of what these chemicals are in the vaccines and what we're putting them in and what's actually going to the children and the impacts they're having. Because there's plenty of independent studies which are labelled conspiracy that are showing the damaging health effects. Um, of these of these uh, uh, chemicals. Now you talked a little bit about social engineering, that that programming uh, through the mainstream media and and using events like false flags to elicit a fear based response uh, in the the minds and the hearts of the masses, so that it helps to continue the agenda of the consolidation consolidation of power, but. The community, the awakening community, the, 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 even the, the general populace, they, they're becoming really, uh, it's becoming so much easier for them to see through the lies and the deception. And that sort of breeds a lot of hope. And there is a, a big momentum building for, uh, I guess, the tipping point, the, the, that, that point where there is a collective sort of acceptance around the uh the basic bullshit that the it's all one big farce any mainstream narrative that you can ask that you can look at is either inaccurate incomplete or just um you know basically designed to be deceptive and and full of shit so that gives a lot of hope and and as i mentioned earlier there is a lot of people within the government structures um, and also, as I mentioned, police, military, whatever it may be, the bureaucracy, the administration side of things, that do see this stuff. So do you see a bit of a, I guess, an internal war um, from the government point of view? Do you think that there are people uh, working towards, uh, I guess, dethroning this cabal that has taken over the policy of you know, the, the modern day government? Yeah, I, I, I definitely uh, see a, a tremendous promise, actually. The, the, the consciousness of humanity has been rising at a pace that is totally unsustainable for the powers that be. In truth, I get a good chuckle out of the fact that for all the power of the powers that be, I mean, let's, let's be frank here, the powers that are running the world, they own the financial system, which means they have an infinite supply of money. And I think people really should contemplate what that means when you have an infinite supply of money that is power 
And with that money, this nefarious, uh, psychopathic, uh, largely pedophilic uh, group of individuals who are running the world with that finance have used that money to buy virtually everything and everyone that can be bought. So when we look at our governments, these people don't serve us at the top levels. They serve the bankers. And I mean all of our Western governments. You name me one that's not under the thumb of the bankers. Uh, all of the major states, especially Australia, uh, also Canada, the United States, Britain, all the Northern European nations. There's a little bit of uh, dissent among some of the Northern European nations and even some of uh, you know, Southern Europe as well. But at the end of the day, for the most part, our governments are completely bought and paid for. It's very disgusting and obvious when you just look at them and what they say. They are uh, the most amoral people on the planet. Uh, again, many of them here in the UK are pedophiles. This is simply not debatable in any serious way. Um, and I would argue that that's part of the club. And I wouldn't let these people uh, join the club either unless they did something like have sex with a little boy or a little girl and film that stuff because I know I can control somebody if I've got that type of uh, evidence on them. So it would make sense that in order to join the club, you have to be so heavily compromised in the first place uh, that you're never going to speak honestly about the way it all works. This is the kind of thing that the powers that be have done. They own the governments, they own the media, they own the corporations, they own Hollywood, they own the police, they own the courts, they own everything of any value that can be uh, used for constructive or destructive purposes within society. And they use their ownership of these sellouts throughout all of these various aspects of society to control the world in a very destructive way, uh, which is only beneficial to them in terms of maintaining their tyranny. This system is breaking down, there's no question about it. More and more people are realizing the nature of this system and understanding the head of the snake, which is the financial aspect of this. Because while we can argue about who's controlling the world, uh, what we can't really argue about reasonably is the method of control. And the method of control is finance. And that very much hits at the core of the solution, which is actually quite simple. And more and more people are getting this. And you, you can't unlearn this once you know it. Once you know how finance actually is being run, and how a small group of individuals largely identified as Jewish, which is a big problem for the Jewish people, and I would recommend they take stock of the fact that when people fully realize the magnitude of the crime that is being committed against them in terms of what the bankers have done and how even to this day they are demanding that we pay them more money. When they say that we're in debt, what do they mean, mean by we are in debt? Who are we in debt to? Is it the same people who are living high on the hog, who are paying themselves massive bonuses, snorting coke, doing all sorts of debauchery, and basically running roughshod over the world through financial abuse, a fraudulent system? It's those who they say we owe the money to, which tells you everything about who's in power. This is not rocket science. People are figuring this out. And the powers that be are shitting themselves, literally. And I get a good chuckle out of it because for all their power, they are losing because the most powerful weapon of all is the truth. We have the truth. And for me, that's the step. That's the necessary step. And the most important first step is seeking and understanding the truth. And I'm not talking about being a genius here. I'm talking about being a human being with a functioning brain because a functioning brain will allow everyone to know what you need to know to be able to understand how this world is really functioning. And people are doing that in unprecedented numbers. And this is what gives really great promise and why I'm very uh, realistically optimistic about where we're going. The system is irreversibly changing. The question is, are we going to have a third world war and a nuclear Armageddon, or are we going to be smart enough to realize that the powers that be actually are trying to instigate a third world war? You look at the policies, how can you conclude otherwise? I mean, you look at U.S. policy, picking a fight with Russia. Russia hasn't done anything to merit any of this madness, these sanctions and whatnot, either has Iran. These two nations just happen to be two examples of nations that are not bowing to the imperial system, especially Iran. I mean, you look at Iran, its, it's history is amazing, truly amazing, the peaceful nature of this uh, country, the fact that it's been a sanctuary for Christians and Jews for millennia. <laughs> that this country is perceived to be in this truly Orwellian existence of ours as the threat, and that we in the West are the good guys trying to prevent this evil threat from 
uh, affecting us. It's, it's a world upside down. And people are seeing it for what it is. And this was always a necessary first step. And it was always going to cause things to come to a head. And that's what we see now. It's coming to a head. So the powers in, in Australia are saying, you must inject your kids with poison. Okay. How many Australians are going to inject their kids with poison? Either out of their complete ignorance of the facts or fear. And how many are going to stand up and say, I'm not going to do that. You're going to have to kill me or imprison me before I give my consent to the poisoning of my children. This is a very necessary thing for it to come to a head. How we deal with this is what, to me, is the key. Are we going to be stupid, emotional, uh, knee-jerk, reactionary, or are we going to be intelligent, using our brain in its full capacity and actually going about things in an intelligent and wise and compassionate and conscientious way? That's the decision. You know, I understand the anger, believe me, I understand the anger very well. I have plenty of anger, but I've used that anger and channeled that anger in constructive ways. I think that's one of the greatest tasks that we face, is to take that righteous anger that you feel, especially as you become aware, and channel that in a constructive way. Yeah, well, the the vaccination legislation that starts, I think it started on the 1st of January here, um, it's targeting the uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged um, citizens in our country uh, because to start, yeah, to start it is, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So it's not mandatory, but uh, if you don't do it and you're on the dole, or you know you're getting uh, financial benefits from the government, then you are co coerced into taking uh, drugs, and uh, as we know, that's against the law. So um, I, there is no there is no leg f uh, to stand on with this policy. Um, also, I've got a, a you know I'd like to raise awareness around uh, our current prime minister um, Malcolm Turnbull. He's an ex uh, uh, employee of Goldman Sachs. I think it was around two thousand one, so quite a while ago. But I see that as a serious conflict of interest, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, the uh, you know, sort of the citizens of Australia should be looking at why that is the case, and and because as you said. The financial and banking industry is the head of the state, the snake. The way that money is created in society uh, is uh, designed to be filtered and consolidated into these power structures. There is no spreading of wealth. Wealth inequality in Australia, for example, increasing. Poverty is increasing. You've got 18% uh, kids in poverty, 15% um, in general. And then a report just released, I think, this week says that, uh, that uh, the pensioners, uh, one third of them, like 36%, I think it was, were below the poverty line. Now, we need a whole restructuring of our economy. Um, I may as well plug someone just quickly, uh, a political party that has just risen in Australia called the Australian Sovereignty Party. And they've got two policies to deal with this banking issue to cut the head of the snake. One is a transaction tax and one is also the um, the taking back the power for the creation of money uh, through legitimate and authentic uh, means and that they understand all of these issues. I'm really surprised. I've, I haven't seen a political party uh, anywhere in the world that has dealt with the, uh, these, the complexity of these issues in, these, in a robust fas uh, fashion. So I recommend anybody around the world to check these guys out. Um, I'm a full supporter of them. I know that you've got an initiative that you've just launched, World Citizen Solutions, and yep. it, it is for the uh, design to inhibit any World War Three breaking out and, and getting people to, uh, I guess, collectivise, to agree um, on, on saying no to war and not funding the this military, industrial, media, politico, banking sort of complex that has basically, that permeates everything uh, you know, all aspects of society. So um, would you like to talk about that? Yeah. You know, one thing I'd, I'd say about it is that, um, you know, we've got so many words, so many words that have been be became, uh, become very problematic, you know, world, uh, it, because new world order, if you use the word world, you know, that's a problem. Citizen. Citizen historically is uh, uh, an individual citizen of a state who's entered into a contract with the state. Um, that's problematic for a lot of people. Collectivism is uh, very problematic in the minds of many people as well. They see collectivism as the problem. 
and and then you know we've got a, a, so many other words that we can cite and symbols as well. The swastika, you know, the swastika uh, before it was reversed by the the National Socialists in Germany. Um, you know, this symbol to this day is a beautiful symbol of life. It's not a negative symbol at all. Um, so we give power to words and to symbols, and this is the world that we live in, and it's a minefield. The powers that be, I have to give them credit, have really uh, sabotaged so many, so many words, perverted the meaning of them, and so we have this minefield to walk through trying to communicate on so many different subjects. So the, the world citizen uh, dot solutions uh, strategy basically is a means of lawfully, peacefully removing ourselves from uh, contractual agreements to pay for, for murder, for mass murder, for war. Um, I think, you know, it's imperative that we reach the point that ultimately we not only see the criminality of the policies of our governments, but remove ourselves and stop participating in that. Again, this takes action. You know, you're not just going to meditate uh, your, uh, your non-compliance, non-participation in war. You have to do things actively to get out of it. There are a lot of people out there not paying their taxes right now. I haven't paid uh, tax to the U.S. federal government um, since the 90s. And, and ultimately, I will never pay uh, any government that I can prove is using that money to commit mass murder. But to do that in this world means you will risk your livelihood. You may very well go to jail. Um, and hell, you could even be killed potentially. But... This is a necessary step, but it's not a realistic step for a lot of people. There are plenty of good people out there who were paying their taxes to, so that they can keep their job and put food on the table, feed their children and their families. And, and I, I, I have no problem with these people. I really don't. I have love and respect for people, working class people, mothers and fathers and others who do what they de need to do to be able to support themselves and their families. What I want to do is be part of changing the reality for ourselves so that we are never compelled to pay for someone's murder because that is, despite the fact that it's a necessity for people in this current existence, I mean, being realistic here, if you just stop paying your taxes, very likely you're going to have problems and you're not going to be able to feed if you have children and a wife and a mortgage and whatnot. You're not going to be able to feed them. So that means you're going to be out on the street that's not very good. You know, I, 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 I don't want that for people. Uh, for those that have the courage and the strength and the ability to resist paying taxes, well, love and respect to you. But I also give my love and respect to working class people who don't have that option. So it's time to make that an option. It's time to make that a viable option so that we can lawfully, peacefully remove ourselves from the obligation to pay for mass murder. And there's a way for all of us to participate in a process to actually make that a reality. And the strategy of that, uh, you know, I'm just not revealing that. If anything happens to me, um, it will be revealed. Uh, if, if I have an accident, <laughs> quote unquote, uh, or if I end up in prison for some bullshit excuse, then the strategy will be revealed. I've made sure of that. But right now, what we need is a reasonable amount of resources to be able to do all the things that need to be done to put everything in place that needs to be in place to actually fully launch the plan and announce all the details of it. So there is a certain level of faith um, and uh, trust for those who have given. And I'm immensely grateful to those who have given thus far. I mean, at the end of the day, the strategy involves lawfully, peacefully removing ourselves from the obligation to pay tax. The details of how exactly we intend to do that, uh, that will be announced in the next month or two, all things going as planned. Watching the, the gun debate, the executive action of the Obama administration, uh, which is he's obviously a puppet for you know, those who are the oligarchs who have taken control, but um, he shed a tear for those victims of gun violence. And, you know, obviously, we, we would like to minimise gun violence and, and violence in general in our societies. I think the materialistic consumerist structure sort of has amplified and exacerbated that. But um, what about a tear um, shed for the millions of children and innocent uh, victims of the wars in the Middle East? Where's the tears for, for those guys? 
um, the whole Palestinian situation. I mean, the, the, that's an absolute genocide that's going on uh, in that region of the world. That we see the divide and conquer strategy of these gun controls. I've seen it online and watched people um, be like, no, no, it's really good. Well, look, these gun, I'm all for minimizing violence, but these gun laws really are more um, centralization of power and they're not going to have any effect. And the whole narrative around gun violence is actually skewed as well because the 30,000 people that die from guns in America each year, 20,000 of them, the 20,000 of them are by suicide. And they would, have, they would have committed suicide anyway because if you have a look at the stats around suicide, America are quite average with the amount of suicides compared to other nations around the planet. So I, I've really witnessed a divide and conquer strategy to, regardless of, you know, um, uh, how much they've gained from this process in terms of power, they've also impacted and, I guess, misdirected people um, from focusing on the real issues. And the real issue is what you're talking about now. We have a serious um, risk or potential of entering into a World War Three scenario. And the strong majority of people I know uh, who do not want that. They don't want that for their kids. They don't want that for their families. They don't want them that for the Syrians or for the Iranians or anybody else. Nobody wants war, and we're not going. And we should stand up and say no to the military-industrial complex and the banking complex, this banking oligarchy uh, that has been financing these wars for the last century, both sides. So uh, I really would. Um, compel people to to uh, encourage people to think about what that what the real issues are as Ken you've just really identified and look at what sort of ways that you can contribute uh, to actively um, uh, inhibiting that process from manifesting and it sounds like that's exactly what you're trying to achieve you can yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm no hippie, you know, I'm an ex-Marine, I've, I've been in a war, I've, I've, I've seen, you know, what's involved in it, and um, it's ugly, you know, I mean, if you have to do it, then you do it. I watched a really uh, good program on Russia Today a few months back, I, I didn't watch the whole thing, but I caught a really fascinating segment about these uh, U.S. military, uh, you know, veterans who had fought in Vietnam and they, they had to go back to Vietnam to, to, to basically atone for their sins, to ask forgiveness and to confess their sins. And while they were back there, they were uh, put together with a, a Viet Cong, a Vietnamese man who was a member of the Viet Cong through three wars, World War II and then the French, um, and then when the Americans came. So he had been through some really nasty stuff, you can imagine. And and they sat there, and these white guys, uh, basically white veterans of the United States military, um, were just extremely emotional and, you know, very uh, melancholy and uh, even crying and really distraught and explaining the hardships and the, the, the post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, the problems they've had with mental health and so on. And then they uh, showed this Viet Cong veteran who'd been through three wars and you looked at him, and he was just like the most kind of placid, you know, peaceful, contented, smiling guy. And uh, they asked him, you know, do you suffer from any of these problems, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder and whatnot? And he, he kind of smiled and said, no, of course not. You know, <laughs> Because when you get down to it, these people are defending their homeland. And if you are not a coward, you would fight to defend your homeland, wherever you come from. And if you sat by and watched foreign entities invade and occupy your country, steal your land and kill your family members, your people, and did nothing, you would be a coward. But we call these people who fight back today terrorists. It's quite laughable, you must be kidding. If the situation were reversed, we would understand that those who were defending the nation uh, from a foreign invader are the most heroic of all. And whatever weapons, whatever means necessary would be yielded to go ahead and repel any kind of such offense against the people in the nation. And yet this is what people have done and they don't suffer like we do. You know, as an ex-Marine, I just thank God 
that I never had to kill anybody. I would have had I needed to, and I didn't need to. Thank God for that. There are 22 American service members a day who are committing suicide. You were speaking of suicide a bit earlier. 22 American service members a day are committing suicide. Why? Because we sent them off to fight illegal, immoral, unjust wars for Israel, Israeli policy, and they've come back so scarred and traumatized that the best options for them are alcohol, drugs, uh, venting that rage and violence and street violence or beating their wives and children. A lot of these people end up homeless and eventually they end up offing themselves, committing suicide to the tune of 22 a day. War is a nasty business. You'd never want to be involved in it if you were sane, unless you had to be involved in it. But America and the West hasn't been involved in a defensive war for some time. Uh, America in particular hasn't really been invaded. Even Pearl Harbor doesn't really count. And this, Pearl Harbor is part of Hawaii, which is a stolen nation, you know, still seeking justice. Most people don't know anything about it, but that's the reality. It was stolen land. It's not truly American territory, even to this day. So even Pearl Harbor doesn't count. America hasn't been legitimately attacked since really, you know, the War of Independence. I mean, you know, there's some other small examples, but in truth, it's been hundreds of years since we've had a legitimate excuse to exercise our military power. We are the offensive guy. We are the terrorists. And this is not a good way to go. Um, America had goodwill all around the world. And that's all gone now. It's all gone. You know, I don't think they really deserved it in the first place if you look at the historical reality. But um, whatever goodwill existed has pretty much vanished around the world. And America, after the po you know, in the post-petrodollar system, is going to be a third world nation. It literally is going to be a third world nation. The American people largely have no clue about this. Many do, but many don't. And this is the way I see the world. We can, we can sit by like sheep being led to slaughter and allow this to play out, or we can get involved, understand the truth, and do what needs to be done. And I'm, I, again, realistically optimistic that we will do that. But either way, those of us who have a conscience really must do the best we can um, without any real attachment to the result, because it's not up to, as I've said earlier, it's not up to me, it's not up to you, you know, it's up to us. And if enough of us decide to make the world a better place, it will be a better place. And people won't even recognize the world that we live in when we turn it right side up, because it's literally upside down. When we turn the world right side up and actually have leaders that have honor and integrity and get rid of all of these nefarious psychopathic uh, individuals, uh, whether it be by uh, due process of law or if they insist uh, pressing the buttons that are equate to mass murder, if they must be eliminated themselves in order to stop this madness, then that would be probably by many people's uh, imaginations divine justice. But one way or the other, the actions of this minority that are running the world who are constantly pitting us against each other in the divide and rule stratagem, this uh, nefarious group of people must be confronted. And we can, because at the end of the day, really they have no power but that which we have given them. And that's the irony here. And it's part of my optimism, a big part of it. They have no power but that which we have given to them. We can take that power back tomorrow if we want, and we can have a better world. And that's really what it's all about. So, you know, I think as long, I don't think, I know, if we do what we're capable of, we're going to hand something over to our children that we can be truly proud of. There's been a few uh, whistleblowers, um, a bit of information just recently around the Pentagon leaking information to Assad and the Syrian regime um, around ISIS stuff. Uh, there really does seem to be uh, an accumulating number of insiders who understand this and are uniting. Uh, to deal with this in, as you said, an honourable, authentic and, and, and mor uh, moral way. So the, it, it is building. Um, anybody watching this who, who is in the power structures to, us, to certain degrees, uh, I would be looking at sort of uniting with those within your area uh, and talking about these sorts of things because you need to choose the right side and the right side is truth. The right side is justice. The right side is love. And in saying that, you did speak about not being a hippie, but at the uh, the Freedom Summit's comment uh, conference, 
when you weren't allowed yeah. into Australia, you did a beautiful presentation, uh, which really was uh, within the spiritual paradigm. And, and uh, it was a, I, I found it very inspiring and it really reflected uh, the bigger picture, the bigger context that we find this, this war, this conflict, this uh, black and white yin yang, not, not racial as in the, the, the light dark, uh, the, the whole um, the duality uh, of our construct. So, um, uh, you know, uh, you might not be a hippie, but you've definitely nailed the big picture as well, Ken. Well, well, you know what? I'm, I've just been very, very blessed uh, to recapture the ability to think for myself. And uh, again, it's a big part of my optimism, knowing that I'm not the smartest guy uh, in the world. Uh, far from it. I'm fairly clever, but uh, I'm not exceptionally smart. It's amazing what you can do when you recapture the ability to actually use this brain, which is a very powerful tool, but not just the brain, the heart. You know, my decisions in life have been dominated by uh, the heart. I have done um, so many things that the head was saying, that's crazy. What the fuck are you doing? You know, and your friends are telling you that's fucking nuts, man. What do you mean? Come on, you can't do that. And my heart said, no, that's the right thing to do. And when you, when you walk that path where your heart uh, is the driving force behind your decisions in direct contradiction to what your head is telling you, uh, when you combine the heart and the head, you know, wisdom and uh, the heart center, you know, the heart chakra or, you know, the, the life force, you know, the spirit, the soul, the, you know, this, this aspect of our existence is very powerful. It goes back beyond our so-called birthday um, I'm a very spiritual uh, being, you know, I'm very aware of the reality of spiritual existence. I disagree with my atheist brothers and sisters at the same time, love and respect to you, uh, regardless of our differences of opinion. Um, I have found personally that I'm not, I don't believe in heaven or hell. Uh, I really don't. I find that to be quite a silly concept. Uh, you know, I don't believe there's anything you could do in one lifetime to warrant eternal hell or eternal reward um i don't care how good or bad you are i'm very much convinced that the journey spiritual journey is one that is uh, never ending uh maybe we reach that point of so-called enlightenment and uh, everything is bliss and oneness and it, it is uh you know in the the later dimensions the fourth fifth and beyond dimensions that we start to really experience that i don't know but i'm not looking for a reward one thing i do suspect however in terms of spiritual uh, evolution is that if your decisions are based on fear I have a feeling you'll be uh, forced to re-experience uh, to repeat uh, hardship and pain and suffering over and over and over again until you eventually find the strength to overcome the fear and operate on the basis of love and there's a, a great great scene in the movie B for Vendetta which is really my favorite movie on so many different levels there's so many beautiful messages in the movie but it's a very very uh incredible scene where she's being imprisoned and you know tortured mentally and physically and and um you know threatened with death and eventually she reaches the point uh where she's told either you tell us what we want to hear or we're going to kill you and she says okay i'm ready to die and uh very ironically then the the character v says that's now you're completely free. And I believe that's the way it is. When you operate on the, uh, on the level of love and the heart, um, there is a liberation that is involved in that process that is beyond what most can imagine. And you'll never know it unless you can overcome fear. Um, so I actually, a big part of why I do what I do is that I want people, I want people to experience that kind of liberation. I really, I know this feeling. It's beautiful. And no matter what happens to me, uh, I'm okay. You know, I mean, I, I would prefer to avoid the worst case scenarios of imprisonment, torture, uh, threats against uh, family and harm to those I love and so on and so forth. These are not nice things to contemplate. Uh, but at the same time, I don't have any uh, real concern about where this spirit is going. I'm operating on the level of, of genuine love for all of my human family. And I mean all of my human family and a desire for each one of us to be able to live as independent, uh, conscientious, moral thinking beings. And, and in that kind of uh, state,
this world, as I've said earlier, it won't even resemble what we see right now. You won't even recognize it. You know, all of these major problems that we face today, all of these things can be solved. Every single problem that you're aware of can be solved. I don't care what it is, Fukushima or, you know, the banking system or the threat of rogue governments and all this, whatever it is, ISIS, whatever it is that you think is the biggest problem, global warming or climate change, all of this, all of this can be sorted out. We have the solutions just waiting for us. So um, I hope we do it. I really do. But in, in my case, I'm not worried about it either way. This is part of the liberation aspect of understanding things on a spiritual level. You can't actually kill me. You know, even if a bullet is put into my head tomorrow, uh, there are people who are going to remember things I said, and uh, I will have impacted people irreversibly so, regardless. And aside from that, I'm sure that I'll reincarnate in some form or fashion. I don't know how, and I don't need to know how, but I have a feeling that I've done what I needed to do to overcome one of the bigger challenges of spiritual evolution, and that is overcoming fear and letting love be your guide. Well, not only are you a voice uh, for the future, um, Ken, you're a heart of the future too. You know, the heart is the 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 first brain that responds to its environment, and we should we should all be tapping in uh, to the the wisdom that naturally is encoded exists uh, within the that part of us. It's just absolutely beautiful. What you've just said then was absolutely beautiful. Um, I'm sure it would resonate with your atheist brothers and sisters as well, um, as well as everybody else, because it is the uh, the fundamental framework that we, we really need to incorporate to process all of this heavy, dense energy around uh, the dysfunctions of our world um, in a healthy, productive, functional and, and positive way and, re and realistic way. I've, I've used that term optimistically realistic for a long time myself. Uh, I like to <laughs> look more on the positive side, but I'm not going to not deal with the, the facts, the reality as well. All right, Ken, um, uh, we talked briefly about World Citizen Solution. Can you elaborate a little bit further about how can people get in touch with that? Um, how much money do you need to raise? Um, and what's the next steps from here? Um. Yes, well, uh, the, the website that has the, the link to our crowdfunding site is worldcitizen.solutions. So www.worldcitizen.solutions. Um, they can go there. The information that we're able to uh, uh, put out is on that site and also the crowdfunding site on Indiegogo. Um, we're, we're nearly halfway there um, in terms of what, we've, uh, what we need. $79,000 is the amount that we've budgeted after looking at all the various expenses and what we, uh, we know we, we will have to uh, fork out in terms of finance. Um, I'm, I'm feeling very uh, inspired and grateful. Uh, we've had like 400 donors in the last 16 days or so lot of smaller donations and some bigger ones coming through uh, now and then as well um, but a hugely uh, resonant resonating uh, reaction from people um, it, it is a, a real blessing to have people have that kind of faith and confidence to give as much as they have so even if we weren't to get the entire amount um, I feel really blessed and, and grateful to those who contributed but I'm also extremely confident that we will get it if we needed to extend for a short period uh, we could do that but um, uh, we need this money to be able to do the full launch again I repeat it's it's about removing ourselves in a peaceful lawful way from any contractual obligations to pay for mass murder so it's a it's a real application of the principle of not in my name you know instead of just saying not in my name uh, we mean not in our name and ie we're not going to pay for it so I'm very, uh, very, very optimistic about this particular plan, but also the, the bigger, broader picture. Um, I put this plan forward because it's been there for years, uh, but there's one thing that I've learned over the years, and that is timing is everything. I believe the timing is now. I believe people have reached that point now where it's like, uh, really, enough is enough. Enough is enough. Is, is it not enough yet? Are we going to continue to carry on with this madness, uh, letting these traitors in our governments carry out these clearly puppeteer policies where they have no 
resemblance to reality or wisdom. Uh, are we going to continue to allow this to happen? How long do you think we can sustain this? I believe we've reached a point where people realize we cannot sustain this much longer. It is time to seriously mean not in my name, not just say it. And uh, I believe this plan can do it. So 2016 to me is an exciting year. If people uh, like what I've said or think that the plan has any merit, please give and share the link to the crowdfunding site. Um, this is how we're going to make it a reality. Beautiful. Now, I just wanted to say one other thing. Uh, you mentioned before we've got solutions. Oh, yes, we do. We've, as you said, the banking solutions, as the Australian Sovereignty Party that I mentioned before, have got some amazing policies. But I've also got some, um, I've spoken to some really progressive and, and, and genius guests from my point of view. These are the real rock stars of our society from my point of view on my uh, YouTube channel. Um, examples are Jeff Lawton, Michael Tellinger, uh, Helena Norberg Hodge, Rupert Sheldrake. There's an array of guests there that have, uh, are really leading the way uh, in providing, uh, identifying the issues and also uh, designing the solutions as we move into our, I would like to hope, a uh, free, just uh, and ethical future for humanity. All right. Thanks for joining me, Ken. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we go? Oh, I, I just want to say thank you, uh, brother, for what you're doing. And uh, yeah, all those guests you've just mentioned, beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I, I absolutely love Rupert Sheldrake and Morphic Resonance. It's something that if people are feeling a little down and uh, pessimistic about it all, really, I highly recommend you, you look up Rupert Sheldrake and, and get his book, Morphic Resonance, or watch some of his interviews uh, about it. It's a very, very, very exciting physical reality that has uh, you know, evidence that is empirical and undeniable that shows that when we reach a certain point, uh, this consciousness is going to permeate throughout uh, human society. And, and the powers that be, I'm convinced, they know this too. And they know we're getting close. And again, they're shitting themselves with all their power and all their might. They're shitting themselves knowing that this thing called critical mass, uh, morphic resonance, the hundredth monkey, uh, the tipping point that it exists and we're getting closer so the one last thing i'd say is for people to realize listen it's not the masses that that really matter it's that conscious minority which is growing day by day that's what's going to define where we go if enough of us become conscientious and actually act on that conscience that we've developed we will create a better world it's just that simple so uh it's up to us no matter what anybody thinks it's not up to them it's up to us and we're in the driver's seat as long as we want to be. So let's do it. Let's make 2016 a breakout year for truth and justice. Well, an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining me, uh, joining me on the channel. For those who watch it, if you've got a little bit of that energy with inside of you that uh, is sort of encouraging you to look at how you can move beyond your own sphere, your own bubble, um, we all have to make our sacrifices and focus on uh, our family, our, uh, called, you know, our, our actual nuclear families, our um, extended families, and also our human families. So um, get involved um, and, and fight the good fight. Excellent, brother. Excellent. Cheers, Ken.